seeing you there. Hello, I'm Alan Stoga, chairman of the Telberg Foundation. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this 2020 celebration. Oops, we're going to start over. Hello, I'm, I'm not broadcasting. You can go, Alan. Now, this is why you do things live and not virtually. And we're just testing you to make sure you're all paying attention. That said, I want to welcome you to this 2020 celebration of global leadership, virtually, not live and in person. Welcome from around the world. 2020 has obviously been an awful year. Pandemic, global recession, social unrest, political oppression. It sounds like something out of Shakespeare or perhaps Blade Runner 3. But amidst all the doom and gloom, there are green shoots. People who are innovative, creative, who are leaning against what's going on, trying to find better solutions to the challenges that confront all of us. I want you to think of these two days of Telberg as counter-programming. Counter-programming against the doom and gloom, looking for better solutions to build our democracies and our societies in ways that we and our children all deserve. 39 years ago, a Swedish businessman, Boo Ekman, realized that he and his colleagues were spending way too much time talking to themselves and not to, every, to the rest of the world. So he convened an initial meeting in a little town called Telberg, several hours north of Stockholm, with a very simple purpose. Let's begin to think differently. Let's begin to open up the conversation to pull in people from other walks of life, from other, other preoccupations, from other countries, other, other experiences. That was the start, proved to be the start of the Telberg Foundation. And under Boo's leadership, it grew for decades. Today, that approach, I think, is every bit as relevant and needed as it was almost 40 years ago. That basic notion that new ideas are, can be found in crossing borders and boundaries uh, have to be rooted in global values, that connectivity in all of its dimensions is essential to understanding how we can address the issues that confront us. Uh, that's what Telberg is today, and that is essential to our approach to search for new thinking for a new world. Thank you, Boo, for all you have done. One of the most important parts of Telberg's work today and of our agenda for these two days is to celebrate the winners of the 2020 Telberg Eliasson Global Leadership Prize. The Telberg Board and the 2020 Prize Jury, and you will meet many of them over the course of these two days, selected three amazing people from the thousands that you nominated. These three leaders were chosen not only for what they have already accomplished, and those lists are incredibly long, but also for what they will do in the future. Sylvia Earle, for her thoughtful, relentless activism and pioneering research aimed at conserving the oceans for the good of the planet and of humanity. Jared Genser, for his urgency, creativity, and dedication to using the law to free political prisoners, protect human rights, and challenge autocracy around the world. Nithya Ramanathan, for her work to save lives through the innovative application of technology, creating and applying data-driven solutions to global challenges. This is where if we were in room together, there would be spontaneous applause and huzzas. We're not together. I hope you're cheering nonetheless. And I wanna congratulate on, on both the Telberg Foundation board, the jury and your behalf, Sylvia, Jared and Nithya. Thank you very much for what you're doing and for what you will do in the future. Before we go on, I want to acknowledge the support of the Stavros Nyarkas Foundation and in particular, its co-president, Andreas Dracopoulos. We couldn't do what we're doing without your support, and more importantly, without your belief in our mission and in our activities. Thank you very much. One of the things I want to do today um, is to ask you to engage with us, with these leaders, with the rest of the people on the program. Uh, the downside, we've already established the downside of virtual. Sometimes things don't quite work well. The upside of virtual is that we can bring together the literally hundreds of people around the world into a conversation today. 
Um, so where there is opportunity to ask questions, please do so. Where there is opportunity to engage in breakout sessions, I hope you will do that as well. And if we don't get to your questions, please send them anyhow and we will respond eventually. And we'll use that to define our future work program. Now I'm privileged to introduce Jan Eliasson, global diplomat and longtime Telberg friend. Jan is global. His work has always been based on universal values and he is relentlessly optimistic. Even if some days of the week, he describes himself only as a cautious optimist. Indeed, that optimism, that global approach, that belief in universal values is why we named our leadership prize in his honor. Jan Eliasson, thank you for joining us and thank you for your work over the years and your continued engagement with the Telberg Foundation. Jan? Thank you very much, Alan, for this introduction. And uh, thank you for everything you have done to keep the uh, Telberg tradition alive. And I think in particular by pointing to the importance of leadership. Uh, leadership that is adapted to today's condition with a broader definition of how we lead and uh, who we are expecting to lead. And you have been very well, very good in defining and finding the right type of leadership as we uh, see today in the form of these fantastic three people that you will meet more later in this uh, session. Uh, I am probably calling myself a, a, a worried optimist. Uh, I'm not uh, in the pessimistic category, but I must say that in today's world, it's uh, hard to be um, um, hopeful, but I will give you reasons to hope. And I think the uh, perils that uh, Alan pointed to are indeed very, very strong. We have the COVID-19, which puts a, uh, like a wet blanket all over our personal and professional lives. Uh, we have the uh, climate crisis, of course. We have the wars and conflicts that more and more turn into proxy wars and harder to, to mediate, as I've noticed myself. Uh, and you have uh, the polarization, uh, which is uh, very, very uh, strong in many countries. And you see divisions not only um, between countries, but also inside countries growing bigger and bigger. So um, away from the doom and gloom and look for the reasons for hope. And I would point to, uh, first of all, women, women and girls. I think this is the age of full, in full empowerment, full emancipation of women and girls. It will come and it will be a tremendously positive force. Secondly, I believe in young people, youth. I think we should uh, not only work for young people, but we should also work with young people and make them part of the uh, building the future to a much greater degree than we have done up to now. Thirdly, I believe in knowledge and education and uh, innovation and science and technology. This is, we, we have to mobilize those resources, those talents. And by the way, the prize winners represent those talents very strongly. Uh, in order to not, not least uh, fulfill the uh, 17 sustainable development goals. I have them here on my, on my coat. And uh, they are in fact a roadmap for a sustainable world. A, uh, toolbox to repair the world indeed. And uh, fourthly, uh, after knowledge, I would mention international cooperation. Uh, it's absolutely crucial that we realize that the most important word in today's world is together. None of the problems we face today at home or abroad will be solved by us, by one alone. You need to do it together. And I think we see positive signs right now. We see mobilization around the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine, which I hope will be globally distributed and fairly distributed. And we have also seen, of course, the coming change in the United States, where we will see United States enter the uh, Paris Agreement the day after the inauguration. And we will see U.S. coming back to the multilateral uh, arena to a degree that we have waited for for around four years. And that is really welcome news. But I think it's very important that we, that we now realize that we face dangers and we need to really now think, and I think this meeting will be a good chance to do this. We think about the world post COVID. What kind of world will we want to have after the uh, COVID-19? And there I would say there are 
two challenges. One is to go in the direction of multilateralism and choose the path to cooperate and to realize that together is the most important word. But the second thing is to really now focus on, on the quality of democracy. We have seen a very dangerous period. We were close to train wreck in certain uh, aspects of the US debate and US realities. But also in Europe, we have seen questioning uh, developments uh, and very doubtful uh, elements that come out, which really affects the basis of democracy. And I think we need to mobilize everything now around democracy and the quality of our democracy. Uh, the polarization that has been going on will have, uh, in a way, damaged the political life. And we need now to show that the uh, classical liberal democracy can produce results. Results that are tangible for people on the ground, people in the world, who feel that, yes, democracy delivers. And this is what this is all about, in my, in my way, this in my, in my view also in this meeting. Because it is also about, basically, about leadership. Leadership uh, which is uh, courageous, leadership which is competent, leadership which is innovative, leadership which is uh, global, people-oriented, and above all, value-based. And uh, we will see that from the prize winners. But that type of leadership is needed. It will be a broader type of leadership that we include much more of, of society, the civil society, the uh, private sector, the uh, academic world. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. And we need this, not least, to come to the conclusion that COVID-19 should bring us to the conclusion that next time we go together to deal with the basic issues, which to me are, of course, first of all, international cooperation, but secondly, equally important, full and strong democratic societies. So here is what Telbar has been doing uh, from the beginning, and now in this renewed form, uh, it is of critical importance that we take these two tasks seriously, international cooperation and democracy, and that we, uh, with a certain uh, energy, but also sense of uh, optimism, take on this task, because there are many doomsayers and many who think that we will fail. We cannot accept this. It is not dignified to give up, as one of my uh, I, my friends in the Swedish uh, government has told me. So, all to, all, all, in the end, I would just want to say thank you, Alan, and thank you, Telberry, for doing this. And uh, let's do this uh, fantastic discussion uh, together. And uh, in truly, in that word, togetherness will be, the, uh, to me, the key to a good future. Thank you very much. for me. I'm hearing it. Is he muted? People forget they're on mute. Alan, we can't hear you. Thank you, Jan for those comments. And I think particularly for your point that failure is not an option. We really can't say, ah, climate change, we can't solve it. Pandemics, just let them roar. Uh, economies grow unequally forevermore. Uh, we have to come up with better solutions. We do need new thinking. And that is what Telberg, that's why Telberg still exists. Um, and indeed it's why we have started this version of the Telberg Elias and Global Leadership Prize. And we're now going to meet the three winners. I'd like to start with um, Jared Genser, uh, who will be interviewed by a member of the jury, himself a global leader, Shahadul Alam. Um, and they will talk for a bit about, uh, about the challenges of working in the human rights space, of standing up to governments that need standing up to, uh, of saving lives when, when lives need to be saved. Hi, Jared. Uh, I've been meaning to get in touch with you for a long time, so this is a great pleasure for me and an opportunity. But, you no, know, it's kind of unusual to find a human rights lawyer who's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. And the term extractor is a 
word one associates more with a dentist or, or perhaps Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, but political prisoners like me will appreciate the moniker given by the New York Times. Protecting individual rights against those who would deny them is what you do, and you do it persuasively in a strategic manner and you're tenacious. And you talk about uh, an asynchronous philanthropy model, small investments, large returns. In terms of time and effort, they seem huge investments. Do you see them? I'm sorry, I, I, I just missed that last part. You said Over to you. I, I just missed yeah. it. Uh, do they seem huge investments to oh, yeah. you? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Shahadul, for um, interviewing me and to Talbert, of course, for the award. Uh, I know you were a former political prisoner yourself uh, for many months, and you know exactly uh, the importance of the kind of uh, work that I do. And everything I do, I do for people exactly like you, who uh, at great risk to themselves uh, stand up to authoritarian regimes, knowing that their, their lives and security could be at stake. Uh, yes, this is, of course, enormous investments of time and work. Uh, some of my uh, my hardest cases can take thousands of hours if you're looking at individual political prisoner cases. Uh, and I've learned over the course of my career now, some 20 years, having done 50 cases of this kind from start to finish, uh, how complicated it is to find the right set of legal, political, and public relations advocacy efforts to get my clients out of jail. Uh, every case is different, every country is different, um, but there are obviously uh, common approaches that one can undertake uh, to try to get that done. But it can be very, very difficult and undoubtedly very, very time consuming. Well, apart from the 50 or so cases, you've also written over 180 op-eds. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea how you could run to that. But you say you've never represented someone without having been asked. Uh, there have been some very high profile names, uh, Vaclav Havel, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, San Suu Kyi Desmond Tutu, uh, Anwar Ibrahim, Mohammad Nasheed. Uh, but I'm curious about one of them, uh, about Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, how would you reflect on what she's become, her relationships with the Junta, a denial of what is happening. You've had spectacular successes. Will you reflect on where you may perhaps have failed? <laughs> sure. So, um, well, look, I mean, uh, I represented Aung San Suu Kyi from 2005 to 2010, um, the latter five years that she was under house arrest. And my, my work on her behalf ended the day that uh, she walked out of house arrest. Uh, obviously, I think like many in the international community, I've been uh, really deeply disappointed and uh, uh, and saddened and horrified by uh, the genocide denial that uh, that she and the Burmese uh, junta have uh, demonstrated uh, in recent years with respect to the Rohingya uh, ethnic and religious uh, minority group in the country. And you know, uh, as a human rights lawyer, I call it as I see it, and I speak truth to power uh, whenever it is necessary to do so. That case has been harder for me because as her former lawyer, um, I have an unfair advantage. And so it's been very, uh, to be able to speak out against her. And that has limited what I've been able to say. In fact, this is probably more than I've said publicly uh, in, than in any other fora, um, simply because again, I have um, uh, an unfair advantage uh, in criticizing her. Uh, when it comes to failures, unfortunately, I think uh, all of us uh, who've, worked in any field for many years and seen some success, uh, find that uh, success is only built on the back of many failures. <laughs> um, so that has undoubtedly been my case too. Um, if I think of my largest failure, any very high profile one, uh, it was my uh, my work over uh, literally over six, seven years to try to get uh, the Chinese Nobel Peace Laureate Liu Xiaobo uh, out of prison in China. Um, I actually began representing him about six months before he won the Nobel Peace Prize and then was his representative to the Norwegian Nobel Committee, uh, along with a former client of mine who had been a political prisoner in China, Yang Li. And, you know, it was an extraordinary day to see the award presented to the empty chair. And I knew at that moment 
it was going to be a very, very difficult and long slog. I got to know his wife, Lou Shaw, um, and we spent years doing everything possible that you can imagine uh, to try to get him out, you know, testifying in a dozen parliaments, uh, you know, 20, 25 op-eds in newspapers, winning their cases at the United Nations, you know, one point getting a letter from more than 100 Nobel laureates across the five disciplines uh, to uh, send to, uh, to Xi Jinping. And ultimately, all of that uh, failed uh, to ultimately get him out of jail before he, uh, he died of, uh, of liver cancer in a, uh, in a Chinese hospital. So, I mean, th that was undoubtedly the, the worst day of my life professionally um, when he died. Uh, obviously, I, I'm not responsible for his death. The Chinese government is responsible for his death and the world failed him. Uh, but as the only person actually, you know, signed by him and his family to represent him, there's no way to look at what happened uh, other than as a, as a very painful failure. Well, I wouldn't say that and I'm sure he wouldn't have seen it that way. But, you know, you're not new to this business. You were a young global leader of the World Economic Forum from 2008 to 2013, you've moved mountains, as you did in this case, to try and release the people who've championed. Uh, now, the Torberg Secretary General of the Organization of American States, Louis Almagro, has asked you to be the volunteer diplomat in the post of Special Envoy uh, on the responsibility to protect. What is next for you? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a very exciting new position that I've taken on, um, and it's really about following through on the commitment of all member states of the United Nations in 2005, which adopted this doctrine uh, called the responsibility to protect, which is about uh, the obligation of all states to prevent and respond to mass atrocity crimes. And so I've been hired in this post to help develop a regional system uh, uh, within the Latin America region uh, to uh, help the organization become more effective at that kind of prevention work. A number of years ago, there would have been no thought that this was a real issue or concern in the region. But starting in 2014, the situation in Venezuela uh, began to deteriorate substantially. And today there are enormous alleged crimes against humanity taking place in that country. And just this week, uh, or just last week, I released a report, uh, my first report in this role for the OAS that not only found that crimes against humanity were being committed in Venezuela, uh, but also I had no choice but to speak truth to power as it relates to what the ICC prosecutor, uh, Fatou Bensouda, uh, has been doing with this case at the International Criminal Court. Um, and unfortunately, she began a preliminary examination to the situation uh, back in February of 2018, and almost three years later now, has yet to even open a formal investigation into uh, the crisis uh, in Venezuela and these alleged crimes, uh, which, in my view, is an abdication of responsibility on her part in light of uh, numerous ways that we document that she has failed to follow through on her stated commitments uh, to how she conducts these kinds of examinations. And this has resulted in greater impunity in Venezuela and a belief by Nicolas Maduro and his regime that, uh, that they can commit whatever crimes they want with total impunity. Uh, and so this is much of the kind of things I do in lots of different roles that I've uh, had in my career. Um, and luckily in this particular case, I have an extraordinary um, and visionary leader that I work with uh, on this, uh, Louis Almagro of the uh, Organization of American States, who has been an outspoken uh, uh, advocate for freedom, democracy, and human rights in Venezuela, um, and also for the importance of this particular doctrine, the responsibility to protect. Were you ever, ever approached by Julian Assange? Uh, if you had, would you? Have, how would you have responded? I say <laughs> this because in many of the cases, you've pitted yourself against autocratic regimes. You've talked of getting states to live up to their commitments. But your own country, which has presented itself as a champion of freedom, goes against descenders and whistleblowers. Where do you position yourself? Yeah. Well, look, I, I, you know, I position myself and I, I would say my true north is, you know, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights uh, and international human rights law. Uh, and when it comes to civil and political rights, uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is a treaty that the United States is a party to, along with most countries in the world, covering about 90 percent of the world's populations. More than 175 countries have signed and ratified that treaty. So, uh, you know, the reality is for me, there are. Uh, 
millions of people in the world who are arbitrarily detained, but that doesn't make them political prisoners. And by that, what I mean is as follows. Um, you can be detained uh, as exactly you were for your work, right? Which is, you know, a violation of your right to freedom of opinion and expression, peaceful assembly, uh, and these kinds of rights. Um, and uh, and when that happens, that makes you uh, a political prisoner. Um, but often, what accompanies those kinds of uh, detentions is also a you know severe set of violations of your due process rights um, as a criminal defendant. Uh, you know, the right to uh, an independent and impartial uh, you know, uh, um, judge, a, the right to the presumption of innocence, the right to access to counsel, the right to prepare and present a defense. Um, and so um, if I look at Julian Assange's case, um, I think there were some violations on uh, the due process side, but as a lawyer, that isn't sufficient for me to just be willing to take up any case. You know, I really want, uh, you know, I really only represent political prisoners when it comes to these kinds of questions. Um, and so while I appreciate that what perhaps he would describe himself as doing is exercising his free speech rights, uh, his rights to freedom of opinion and expression, you know, when he made that massive document dump, dump from WikiLeaks of all the State Department cables, you know, they were not redacted and they put thousands of people's lives at risk in a wide array of ways. Um, and while he may have had a right to do that um, as a matter of freedom of opinion and expression, um, you know, I don't have to like, you know, what, uh, what, what a particular person does or the way that they approached it. Um, and, you know, ultimately, uh, the, the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, which is a body that I uh, have become a real expert at, at practicing before and published a, a book late last year on it. Um, you know, it found that he was being arbitrarily detained in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Uh, frankly, that was one of a very small number of working group opinions over the years that I strongly disagreed with, um, because the working group itself said, uh, has said before, that, uh, uh, that the definition of house arrest is where you are kept in closed premises and physically unable to leave. And this was not the case, in my view, with, with Julian. Assange. Uh, my view is that uh, he voluntarily walked into the mission to escape being uh, extradited anywhere for any of his crimes, and he could have walked out at any time. And so for me, this would not have qualified as an arbitrary detention uh, as such. Uh, we're short of time, so I've got to make this short. You are a high-flying lawyer, but a lot of the work you do is pro bono. You had your eye on the big prize. But the way you defined it was having the biggest impact possible and leverage and the most support to do that. Clearly an intense person. Are you a difficult person to work with? Uh, a lot of very intense people are. And if there is time and we have very little, tell us a little bit about your new film. Uh, sure. Um, well, look, I, I, I guess, you know, I, I, when you talk about if I'm a difficult person to work with, I, I should thank my wife, Elaine, uh, and my two kids, Alexander and Zachary, for tolerating me. Um, undoubtedly, uh, I couldn't do anything without their without their love and support, uh, and that of my parents, of course, as well. But, um, you know, I actually don't consider myself a difficult person. I'm probably a difficult person to be opposing counsel to, um, which is sort of by design, you might say. Um, but, you know, the way that I conduct myself as a leader is, um, you know, is that I try to inspire by by my own actions. You know, I try to give my staff, for example, at my law firm who are brilliant, um, you know, the ability to run, you know, full speed ahead uh, and obviously be in direct touch with clients and to do all of that critical work. You know, I know there's only so much I can do with my time and my day, and I desperately need to rely on others substantially. Uh, and, you know, I, I govern all of my work by the idea of the best idea should reign supreme. It doesn't matter where it comes from or who has it, right? Whether at the very top or the bottom of any particular hierarchy. Uh, and similarly, um, it's, it's critically important to share credit and to give credit where credit is due. Uh, and so I, I think uh, I'd like to think uh, that I, um, you know, we've had now at my law firm for the decade I've run it, you know, more than 50 interns and externs, and we've had consistently positive feedback. But uh, I guess, um, 
you know, so I, I, that's what I would say about uh, perhaps how I am to work with. Just very quickly, I know we're out of time. Uh, uh, I actually am uh, working with Orlando Bloom, uh, the the actor uh, and producer on uh, actually a television series, uh, episodic drama for Amazon um, Studios, which is for Prime Video, which has 150 million viewers worldwide. And this is going to be a television show about a far more handsome and dashing human rights lawyer than me, uh, fictionalized, based in Washington that travels the world freeing political prisoners. So as I was joking, when we were pitching Amazon, ultimately successful to decide to make this show, um, I said it would be a lot easier for me to get uh, fake prisoners out of fake jails working on the writing team uh, as compared to getting real ones out of real jails. So uh, it'll be a nice change of pace and a, an opportunity to expose the issues that I care so much about to a much, much wider audience uh, that isn't a specialized human rights audience. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jared, and thank you, Shahadul. Now we're going to switch from human rights and a certain kind of leadership to a new kind of leadership and technology. We obviously live in an era of profound technological change. Uh, we obviously can sometimes harness that technology, sometimes not so much. But Nithya, Nithya Ramanathan is a person who is dedicated to that harvesting, to, to that harnessing, to that ability to uh, use technology in a, in a way that changes lives, and in particular changes lives uh, for people at, if you will, the bottom of the pyramid. It's not just, can I get a brand new phone that is even faster and smarter with a better camera, but can you actually save people who otherwise are going to die unless they can access new technology. Nithya will be interviewed by one of our jurors this year, Cecilia Vekstrom. Cecilia is an executive with Lego um, and has very generously given of her time during this process. So now I'm pleased to introduce uh, Nithya Ramanathan and Cecilia Vekstrom. Thank you, Alan. And what a joy and privilege it's been to have been part of the jury this year with such an esteemed group of colleagues and what a hard job it was to sift through all those amazing applications. But early on, I have to say, you know, your work, Nithya, just stood out and I was truly inspired by, uh, by what you're doing. So I'm just super glad to be actually in this situation when I get to interview you. And thank you, Nithya, for joining us. So you are the chief exec and co-founder of NextLeaf Analytics, a tech nonprofit dedicated to preserving human life and protecting the planet. And by way of an introduction, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself, who you are, how you ended up working in this space? What inspired you and what got you started? Yeah, sure. And Cecilia, thank you so much. Um, it's it's a real pleasure to get to speak with you. And thank you to the Talberg Foundation. This entire process, as, as uh, all important events, the process itself has been extremely just illuminating. So I've, I've been really appreciative. Uh, I got started, really, you could say at a young age, uh, right from when I was growing up, dinner table conversations were always about uh, what is true, uh, what is objective. Um, I had a father who was a climate scientist and uh, a mom who ended up becoming a writer. And so dinner table conversations were never light in our household. Uh, I was an engineer in Silicon Valley and I, I was designing computer chips. And as Alan said, I, I, I was never excited about designing that faster computer. So when I went to graduate school, uh, I was working with one of the early pioneers of the internet, Deborah Estrin, and uh, got a chance to start to explore how to build sensors and technology systems to better understand our environment. So I got really interested in arsenic poisoning in the groundwater in Bangladesh, uh, an issue that affects millions of people in that area, and really how better data and sensor systems could actually help us identify the solutions to those problems. I ended up getting really connected with the communities there. I'm Indian, um, but culturally uh, in Bangladesh, uh, there were a lot of similarities in the village. And I found that the women and children were really, really looking to me to solve the problem. And yet I knew at the end of the day that as a researcher, I wasn't going to be able to actually bring about scale and sustainable solutions for that uh, community, let alone the region. And so when I left, I was 
really frustrated with the entire situation, the um, the sort of stagnation of just better understanding a problem without actually solving and sustaining a solution. So when I left, I actually w left committed to building sustainable solutions that would actually solve problems. And I saw how big data and technology was a critical part of that. Amazing. Um, how, I mean, we as Lego Group, we often talk about our mission being to inspire and develop builders of tomorrow. So what was it really that the purpose or the mission of your organization came to be as, as you took your steps in this space? So I saw early on that there was this tension between uh, scaling solutions and really sustainably solving a problem. So our mission early on was bringing data in order to save lives and doing that in a way that was going to collectively develop solutions that would work. I found in the development sector, it tends to be quite top down often. Um, you have a lot of multilateral agencies often coming to countries and telling them what to do. And so as we built data systems, um, as we've built, gotten involved in the vaccine supply chain and clean cooking, uh, bringing clean energy to households, a key value and component in, for how we work is ensuring that we're actually serving not only the communities, but also countries. Um, often government is a bad word, um, but really, especially in the poorest 80 countries, um, most of the health systems are government operated and government run. And so we found that there's incredible value in actually partnering with and serving the government um, and country priorities. And we bring data to that equation. Um, in general, we see now, you know, truth is under attack, um, debate is shut down. That is one of the huge values that Talberg brings to the global sector. And similarly, I found that data actually does that as well. That when you have objective data and you can bring that to a conversation, it completely changes what's done. And so I've seen rural health clinic um, technicians suddenly be able to ensure that an entire health system in that region is operating because they had access to objective data. Um, and not only one individual, but really the collective. And I found that when you've got multiple women looking at a dashboard, these are rural Indian women who you know, haven't necessarily gone to school, but looking at the data, looking at a dashboard, being able to come together and say, yeah, this actually ex reflects my experience. I found that these clean co this clean coke stove doesn't work for me. And this data actually proves it. It actually amplifies the voice of even the most rural communities um, in order to speak to the most powerful um, foundations and government. So there's really this leveling of the playing field that we've seen happen when we bring objective data to complex systems. Amazing. You actually talk a lot in your work about how you joined forces with ministries of health around the world and your, how you, your technology is protecting the vaccine supply now of one in 10 babies born on Earth. I mean, how do you see leadership and the role of a leader in creating such a systemic change? So I learned lessons around leadership uh, through what was almost a catastrophic failure. Uh, this was about five years ago, and we were partnering with the Ministry of Health in India. And I came in thinking that I knew all the answers. And uh, that's a really weak place to be, um, as I think all uh, good leaders know. And uh, we were in the process of scaling uh, the sensor technology to uh, over half of the clinics across the country in India. And we learned early on through disagreement with the Ministry of Health um, and the priorities really how to balance what we knew from objective data and what the actual priorities and realities were on the ground and how to actually bring those things together. And so now as we um, work closely with ministries of health, I have learned uh, just how important that partnership is and how often countries are actually neglected in this discussion. And so one of the reasons that our sensor technology, which, um, as you mentioned, Cecilia, does protect the vaccine supply now for one in 10 babies born on Earth, 
um, this technology is deployed in over 25 countries. And it is in large part because of that partnership with ministries of health. Um, I always say it's not rocket science to build a temperature sensor. Um, and even working with this data is, um, you know, that's not the complexity of what we do. It's really understanding the realities of the ground, understanding what are the priorities of the ministries of health around the world, and ensuring that we can bring data to actually help them build their solutions. And so now we are in this uh, moment in time. Um, the world has never had to come together to actually address the global pandemic um, in the way that we have. We have never had to distribute the same item to almost every single person on earth. So while developing the vaccine was an incredible breakthrough, we have this opportunity as we develop systems in order to get this vaccine to every person on earth to actually build systems that will be built to last for future generations. This is not just about COVID. Building a strong, resilient backbone for public health that can deliver a COVID vaccine can actually serve generations to come. And we have found that in these conversations with ministries of health, data has been a critical tool for them in order to not only plan for now, but really building resilience systems for the future. Thank you. I mean, it seems like there's some themes that really come through strongly uh, in the work that you're talking about. There's sort of, you know, you mentioned a lot about data, but data as a tool for empowerment and leveling the playing field and creating conversations with multiple stakeholders where no one has more information than the other, but everyone's actually coming together around the same insight and how that can then generate new ideas and solutions. But also, I guess you speak to that theme of togetherness that Jan Eliasson talked about earlier, how that can really bring together new solutions and also create something that is more sustainable for the future. I mean, what are the leadership lessons really from all of, I guess, this year and, and where you've got to today that you're now taking forward into the future? and and how do you want to do things differently to, to get us to a more hopeful future? One of the most critical principles um, and lessons for me is around collective learning and collective leadership. Um, I firmly have, I firmly believe because of my experiences, how critical um, it is um, to bring people together around um, collective uh, ideals that are shared um, and have data underpin those ideals. Um, I've seen too often when technology and data become the end goal itself and how actually destructive that can be. And so um, for me, a big part of my leadership, the second sort of principle is around humility. Um, it's critical that we are humble, um, both because of you know the power structures that exist um, and the differentials, but also because data be can, can become its own sort of monster. Um, and so, for example, you know, part of my leadership has been around advocating very strongly for data sovereignty. Um, countries must have the rights of um, ownership to their data. Um, it's been said often, data is a, a rich resource. Um, it's you know, the new oil. Um, and I, I really see that it is a, a resource um, and a potential avenue for even wealth generation for countries. And so countries owning their own data, that sovereignty um, is a big part of um, equity. Um, and tying that back is, is critical to collective learning. I found how the conversation changes when a country actually owns their data, they're able to step in to um, sort of the global dialogue in a completely different way and in a much more empowered way. So these are the principles that really guide me is collective learning, um, really ensuring the empowerment of everybody around me, both on my team as well as um, the leaders that I serve uh, around the world. Fantastic. We're almost reaching the end of our time together here, but I thought before we part ways, uh, what would be your advice to all of us coping with a world that needs to be pushed in a better direction? It is so critical that we really support building out global solutions, but that those solutions 
not come from a top-down perspective, but very, very much need to be anchored on the realities on the ground. And data is a part of that. Data tells an objective picture, but it's really about us, all of us questioning our assumptions. So as we invest in these systems for scaling a COVID vaccine, as we invest in these more robust systems to get health for all, that each of us are questioning our assumptions and data is part of that, but that we really look not only to our individual perspectives, but what that collective um, vision for the future is and uh, contribute towards that. I think that is the only way that we are going to get to these uh, more resilient, more robust systems um, globally. And I, and I have to sneak in a question because I know, obviously, my own passion is definitely around inspiring the builders of tomorrow, kids of the future to take up careers where they can truly influence a positive change. What would be your <laughs> yeah, what would be your advice to kids growing up today who might be looking at what's going on in the world right now and finding it all a bit of a hopeless place to be, but to sort of maybe still not lose the hope but want to be part of driving that change? What advice would you give them? Uh, so I am a builder at heart, and uh, the advice that I give my children all the time is building for um, solving a concrete problem. Um, often that existential hopelessness, often the assumptions that we make, often the destructive um, ideals that come about are because of these more kind of abstract notions of, of the world. And so I really do have my kids focus on building concrete solutions bringing their objectiveness uh, wherever they can, um, and also just uh, a commitment to serving. Uh, so that that tends to be, those are the principles that our household lives by. And uh, what I also uh, love to see uh, thrive in, in other young leaders. Fantastic. That brings us to a close. I just want to thank you, Nithya. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you and truly inspiring to learn more about you and your work. And also on behalf of the jury of the Thalberg Eliasson Global Leadership Prize and all of us here today, just a huge congratulations. We will be following your work with much interest and wish you the very best. Thanks again. Thank Over you to you, so Alan. Much. And to the foundation. Thank you very much. And I'd like Nithya and Jared, if you would, to stay online, if you would unmute, stay unmuted. Um, we've, we are receiving questions, and I'd like to share at least a couple of those questions with you and, and get, your, get your thoughts. Uh, someone in Nigeria writes, do you think that extreme modernity and technology through social networks, smartphones, dumb phones, devalue authentic democracy and human values? In other words, how do we square democracy, pursuit of human values, and what can be the enormous burden of technology uh, as we've seen during this pandemic. Jared, Nithya, what do you think? Uh, I can jump in, but I think uh, there's, there's a lot for both of us to, to lean into here. Um, in our work, we know that uh, the people on the ground uh, represent the reality. And yet we are seeing with WhatsApp, with social media, the extreme distortion of reality as well. Um, and you know, we know that data misrepresents. Uh, it's not that data always has uh, uh, and some inherent objective truth as well. So um, these are these huge tensions that um, even in my work, uh, I see play out all the time. Um, there are, country governments who um, don't have the best interests of the people in heart. And there's certain individuals who do or don't. So there's all of these tensions. And as I, I continue to say, technology, um, smartphones, these things aren't inherently good or bad. They aren't an end in and of itself. They are tools that are you know, wielded by people who are committed to truth and democracy and people who are not committed to truth and democracy. So. Um, it's it's not really about the technology itself, though, of course, technology has a critical role to play. Um, but for me, it is about the dialogue that is opened up around that technology. And I think if we're not talking with our youth as well um, around how to actually identify truth 
from not truth, um, distinguish right and wrong, um, and really do that through dialogue, not through just um, you know absolutes. Um, then technology won't be able to serve um, those broader purposes that it otherwise can. Jared, the same question. There's obviously been human rights abuses since Adam and Eve walked out of the garden. Does technology, as it's evolving in the 21st century, make your job easier or harder? Well, I think it's a great question. I, and I, I would say, of course, uh, perhaps the answer is both. You'll forgive me for being a lawyer and responding that way. But uh, uh, look, on the upside, there are enormous upsides. Uh, you know, uh, dictatorships and authoritarian regimes rely on their ability to, to silence their own people uh, and to keep a lid on concerns coming from average citizens in, in uh, such a country. Uh, and smartphones and smartphone technology have gone a long way. If you say sort of a picture uh, speaks a thousand words, a video probably uh, will speak a million. And so, you know, you have organizations around the world that are using, um, uh, you know, citizens of the world uh, to document human rights abuses that are taking place, to upload them in real time to uh, to various uh, platforms, uh, and ultimately even to use that kind of uh, information uh, for the purposes of, um, of evidence in international criminal uh, trials. And so I think that that has been a, a huge net positive. Interestingly, you know, the uh, uh, you know, a lot of the international rights that we're quite familiar with, like the right to freedom of opinion and expression, um, you know, uh, were well designed even back when those uh, the treaties establishing them, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, were well designed to adapt to a technological world that didn't yet exist. So, for example, the right to freedom of opinion and expression includes a right to freedom of opinion and expression um, uh, and the exercise of it through any medium you so choose. Um, and that was how it was written uh, decades ago. Uh, and that, of course, would include through smartphone technology, electronic communications, uh, telephones, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, there are new and emerging areas of technology. Uh, Raphael Yust, uh, who uh, is, of course, a former Talbert winner, and I have been uh, already uh, talking a lot about uh, neurotechnology in the 21st century. Um, and the reading and writing uh, of the human mind and the kinds of uh, new rights that might need to be established in that regard. But um, undoubtedly, of course, technology can be used for downsides. You know, in, tech, in China, you, you have a gigantic surveillance state that is being used to capture you know, images through cameras and, and uh, follow people very, very closely. You know, apps that get downloaded by millions of people put up by the Chinese Communist Party that are monitoring every communication you have. Uh, and this is the nefarious side. Uh, but I agree with Nithya, of course, that technology can have, uh, it, technology is generally neutral, but can be used to good or bad ends. Uh, thank you. I've got to say that technology today is not our friend. Um, we, have, we have lost Sylvia Earle, or rather Sylvia Earle is afloat somewhere off the west coast apparently we'll be able to engage with her later we hope but right now um, some significant port portion of california does not want to talk to us what i'd like to do then is segue now to um one of the important strands of, of who and what telberg is uh several years ago when we had this celebration uh live and in person in new york we were delighted and privileged to have a performance by Kaiser William Olson, uh, who is an absolutely amazing cellist. And Kaiser is joining us today along with her pianist accompanist, Therese Loff, uh, who recently recorded this for us. So you will now experience some music. It is a great honor to be performing for you today from the Grunewald Hall at Concerthuset in Stockholm. You will be hearing the last movements from Ludwig van Beethoven's incredible Opus 69, his third sonata for piano and cello in A major. We start with a beautiful cantabile that leads us into one of Beethoven's most incredible, joyous, jubilant movements that we think fits today's festivities. Please enjoy.
you can do this by way of wrap up. There's a wireless transfer back in there. I can't hear you. This one. Send her a message and say, I'm not getting the audio. Alan, we can't hear you, and I keep oh. hearing other participants, so there seems to be a bit of a. Yeah, I am not. Can anyone hear me? Is the question because. I can hear you now, but I, I muted myself. But we can hear only one guest, and then we can't hear you. Andreas, you're never mute. <laughs> so, Andreas, can you hear me, Ron? Yes, yes. Hi, Ron. Yeah, well, we can have a good conversation among ourselves, but it'd be grand to invite everyone else in. Uh, Patrick, are we are we live or are we suffering? Yeah, you're live. So you can go on and present, Sylvia. Okay. And okay. thank you. What what I had said when I was talking to myself a moment ago is that we have evidence that God indeed does exist because she found Sylvia for us. <laughs> so, I, I am delighted to introduce both Sylvia Earle, uh, who is one of my heroes, and Ashok Mirpuri, who's also one of my heroes. Anyone who can survive um, the last two administrations in Washington and come out standing and, and still surviving uh, deserves kudos. So what I would like to do now, and I'm, we'll see if it works. There we go. I'd like to switch to Sylvia Earle and Ashok Mirpuri. Thank you, both of you, what you're doing. Oh. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you, Alan. Sylvia, I'm glad we got you. I think that after a whole year of going on Zoom and Teams, we all need to really get back to real life meetings. So I'm looking <laughs> forward that the next time we're able to do this, we'll do this real life because this sort of fiddling with buttons is a problem. Now, Sylvia, you will not, not remember this, but we met about two years ago in Washington, D.C. at the Environmental Film Festival where your movie was featured, Mission Blue, and it was a wonderful hit. And so it's really a pleasure for me to be able to interview you and first congratulate you on this leadership award that Talberg has given to you. Now, for the audience, you know, many of you may have heard of Sylvia Earle, but, you know, I could go through the accolades. I could go through the prizes that she has received. Uh, she, I am the Singapore ambassador, but she's the ambassador of the ocean. That's the term that's been given to her. The New Yorker called her her deepness. And she's a pioneering oceanographer an explorer. And she's really gotten into ocean conservation for a very, very long time. And, you know, I wanted to take you back, Sylvia, because in all many of the interviews you speak about the first time you encountered the water on the Jersey Shore and how that was so important and fundamental with, to you, but also the role that your mother played because she let you go back in. Tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. Most mothers perhaps seeing their beloved daughter get tumbled around by a wave would rush in, grab them, and never let them go back in the water again. <laughs> but I think it's because I emerged with a big smile on my face that she let me go back in, and I've been going back in ever since. <laughs> and, and that's such an important part, I think, of people growing up. As you introduce young people to the issues of the environment, how do we keep them coming back in? Because it can be very daunting. It can be frightening. You know, when you speak about the challenges of preserving the oceans, when you speak of the challenges of climate change, these are such daunting things. And uh, sort of a young teenager, a young graduate, how do you get them to go back in and then see the value and benefit that it comes? I think when you fall down, you know, you make mistakes. And that's how you learn. If you 
if everything's always smooth and you never encounter any problems ever, I think you, you, you don't develop the courage to tackle whatever comes your way. So you learn from your <laughs> falling down. You learn from getting knocked over by a wave and not letting that keep you down. So I think my having parents who are, always had my back, basically, knowing that if I did fail, it wasn't the end of the world, that I, there was, somebody cared. And I tried to convey that to my own children. And now my, I have four grandsons to let them know whatever happens, it's okay. It's all right. There's, there's tomorrow. We can get over this. Whatever this is. <laughs> so you may have thrown your daughter into the water because she's now a close collaborator of yours to start her own sort of career <laughs> in this. Yes, she is fearless. Well, you know, being fearless is kind of okay, but you need to have that little tinge of terror, knowing that <laughs> you know, there are things out there that you have to be ready to take on, whatever they might be. The unknown, always the unknown. You know, you, you've achieved so much, and today you can look back and speak about everything you achieved. But when you started, you faced a lot more hurdles than most people. You had glass ceilings. People doubted your ability as a woman to do many of the things that you did do. You know, when you when you sort of balance out your successes and your failures, how do you get that balance? How did you sort of keep breaking through these barriers uh, in order to achieve where you where you are today? Well, you know, I I find myself, I think I always have, just looking around. And seeing that there are people who have greater obstacles than I do, you know, but wherever, whatever you do, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too thin, you're too fat, you're, you have, you speak the wrong language or you do this. There are lots of excuses why you can't do something, but if there's something you really want to do, you figure out how do I get from here to there? And you just keep working at it until no matter what the supposed obstacles are, you just find a way. And you may not be able to get to exactly where you want to go, but you can get closer if you keep trying. I, I was not allowed to be the chief scientist on expeditions because why? I wasn't a guy. It's just the idea that women <laughs> could lead expeditions back in the 60s and even into the 70s was, uh, was, was, was hard for culture to accept. But when you just say, I'm going to do my best, hmm, sooner or later, you, people see that you can do what it is you know you can do, and the door opens a little bit and you just walk through. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm very pleased that in this leadership prize, two of the three winners are women. And yep. as the jury went through the nominees, we had a significant number of female nominees, many of whom were very, very qualified. But I am pleased that sort of the numbers are changing. Let me give you a little bit of perspective of the jury when we discussed your nomination, Sylvia, because you're obviously qualified. You deserve every award we can get, give you. But we were looking for leadership. And having achieved so much, and you know, for the audience again, Sylvia is not shy to hide her age. Uh, she turned 85 a few months ago. She keeps repeating that in every interview. So I, I don't feel bad sort of mentioning her age in this. But you've achieved so much. You, we wanted to see what you can do next, and try oh, wow. and just because it's, a, it's a sort of yeah. So what what comes next? Well, realistically, there. You know, I, I do take into account that life is finite, and yet I can still get out there and do things that I have been doing for the last, <laughs> whatever, few decades. So do I plan to keep 
going on expeditions? Yes. Am I still diving? Yes. Do I still want to build little submarines and take people along to show what it's like out in the ocean? Yes. <laughs> Do I want to use the past as prelude and just keep building toward the objectives that I could not have imagined 20 years ago or even 10 years ago? Yes. It's a it's a process, and, and I, I I can't, I can't. imagine um, not continuing doing everything I can for as long as I can to not look back, but to continue to say, okay, what's next? Now what? We've got all these tools in the box. How do we use them? to get to a better place? And how do I share the view with as many people as I can? I realize I've been privileged to spend time underwater and to see things others have not. To keep it to myself and not do everything I can to get others to see what I see, know to the extent that I can, <laughs> whatever is useful and what I know. So by writing, by speaking, by engaging as many people as I can to go out and experience the ocean, to look closely, to look carefully, to connect the dots, to realize that Earth is a biogeochemical miracle and that our highest priority must be to keep the planet safe because if we don't, Nothing else is going to matter. We have to understand that the, our life support system, Earth, is, is changing because of what we're doing to it. And knowing what we know, we have the power, the superpower, of being able to make decisions that will take us to a better place with the air, the water, the fabric of life. and if people could see how important the natural world is to everything else, with even in their own backyard, even in their personal day-to-day -day decisions, in fact, it's what it is going to take. Individuals making everyday decisions times seven billion that will take us either to a continued decline or recovery and then <laughs> that that word that everybody talks about, sustainable future, that we can learn to live within our means, the the the, the planet, the, the, the environment that only has so much to give. We've taken so much for so long. The good news is we can we have the evidence. We have the power of knowing that if we get enough people to be tuned in, to be aware of the reality, we can achieve a sustainable partnership, relationship with nature. And then everything else we care about can follow if we have a secure life support system. We don't have it now, but we can get there. Well, that's an optimistic message, but do you feel a new urgency? There was an interview you gave last year to a newspaper in Singapore where you said maybe the next 10 years will shape the next 10,000. And in terms of your work, how do you see this new urgency coming in? I'm not alone. The climate scientists are saying we are right here with carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide, all the things that are driving the, the warming of the planet with all of the things that follow from that. We, we have time, but not a lot, to make this shift. And I'm encouraged because I see the World Economic Forum, for example, taking the environment seriously, not as seriously as they should, because the economy depends on a sound environment. You can't have an economy if you, you can't breathe. If, if it's you know, if the world is, the natural world is unraveling, and it is, then that's, we, we've got to fix that. We have to, because you don't have health or security 
or prosperity if 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 you're worried about where you're going to, about food about um, air about all the things that keep us alive you know i heard president obama once say that our highest priority must be to keep the world safe for our children well he was thinking guns and things <laughs> but the message we must keep the world safe for our children it means okay we got all the day-to-day -day things all the things people care about but we have to have a world that works in our favor we have had it for more or less 10,000 years i mean things go up and down over long periods of time but it's our impact on these natural cycles that we have control over and yes i'm a, i i am cautiously optimistic but it starts with knowing you can't care if you don't know I mean, you can know about care, but we need to get people to understand the real priorities. Which is why I applaud the work that you do in getting everything out in movies, in interviews, in books, to make sure that more and more people know this. I mean, that is a sort of different kind of leadership to put this right square in the center of the way people deal with it. Can you, we have a time for a last question. Can you finish off a little bit with sort of this bigger ecosystem that you always speak about? How do you see it all coming together? The word biogeochemistry should be on the lips of everyone everywhere. Starting when you're little kids, you learn your letters, you learn your numbers. Can we not take what the children of today and grown-ups too should know that the superpower of seeing what could not be seen 50, 100, any time in the past years ago, <laughs> that, that we have the gift of knowledge. Not everybody has this shared equally, but we need a critical number to realize that Earth is this blue miracle and it's in trouble and we have to pull together the pandemic of 2020 pulls us together makes us realize we're all vulnerable but it's climate it's the fabric of life that makes us also vulnerable if we don't take care of it so the roadmap forward <laughs> every day think about what you can do to leave make the world a better place by your personal actions and joining with others to use your, your mighty powers of understanding that this moment in time will, is this moment, this time, 2020, 2021, right now, we have a bit of time to reverse the decline and come to this point of recovery and stability. It is within our grasp. We need everyone to get on board. I want to be a part of the action as much as as long as I can. Well, thank you, Sylvia, Dr. Earl. Congratulations again on the Leadership Prize. And it's been such a pleasure speaking to you. Back to you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. And I think everyone can now tell why the jury and, and you just met three members of the jury, uh, Ashok, um, Cecilia, and Shahadul was a nine person jury. Uh, you can tell why they selected these three amazing people working in very different fields, very different backgrounds, very different futures, um, but all working together to try to make this work better for all of us. So I want to thank them and congratulate them again and now move on to something really quite practical. Leaders don't get to take time off during a pandemic. Pandemics, wars, economic recessions, uh, it doesn't matter. If you are a leader of a great institution, corporate, philanthropy, academic, government, you have to come to work every day. You have to make it work. And indeed, you have to imagine how to do things differently in ways for which there are no playbooks. In 2020, if nothing else, was a year in which the playbook was irrelevant for all the leaders that I know, and, and they had to make it up. Carol Wainana uh, from Africa 50 and the Telberg board 
uh, is going to now moderate a panel with several leaders from different institutional backgrounds, specifically on that question. How did you cope with a year in which everything you thought was going to happen on January 1st uh, is different by the time we get to January 1st of 2021? So, Carol, uh, over to you. Thank, thank you, Alan. Um, greetings from Nairobi, and uh, let me first um, thank our winners once again. Uh, the work you do and the conversations we've just had uh, are truly inspirational. So keep doing what you're doing in the world. So now let me turn to uh, another. I'll just give it a few minutes. Thank you. So now let's turn to another group of leaders. Um, our esteemed panel today uh, come from different sectors uh, and also wear many hats and have had to navigate their leadership roles um, throughout the pandemic. And so we'd love to hear their stories and, and share some of the learnings that they've had during this period uh, as part of our conversation. So let me quickly introduce them and then we'll just kick off with the conversation. Um, the first panelist is Andreas Giacopoulos. Uh, Andreas is the co-president of the Stravos Niachos Foundation, uh, who is a very great partner of, of Talberg, as you have heard. Um, he is uh, a very dedicated philanthropist, both in his public and, and private life, and I'm sure we'll have a lot to share about some of his experiences uh, during this time. Uh, also on the panel is uh, President Ron Daniels of um, jo Johns Hopkins University. Um, we can imagine the kind of challenges that universities have had to go through during this pandemic. Uh, Professor Dan uh, President Daniels has um, contributed significantly to the growth and strengthening of many areas at jo Johns Hopkins, some of which we'd love uh, to hear more about in our conversation today. We also have on our panel um, Alejandro Santa Domingo. Alejandro, like all our other leaders, wear multiple hats. He's an investor, he's an entrepreneur, he's a businessman, he's a board member, he's a financier. Um, he also has experience across multiple companies and industries. Uh, and so we look forward to hearing some of his experiences um, and especially in, in, in the Latin American countries where he, he, he primarily operates and oversees businesses. And then last but not least, we have Ula Britt. Uh, Ula is an engineer and a business person. Um, she has been at the top of multiple organizations, both as an executive and uh, more recently is um, also a board member of several organizations who has perspectives both from the executive as well as the board, board level. So thank you all our esteemed panelists and thank you for um, being here this, uh, for this conversation. Uh, let me kick off by um, being maybe a little personal, and I'll start with you, Andreas, but invite everybody else to, to jump in on this question. Um, we know, obviously, that 2020 has been difficult from multiple perspectives. If you kind of think of it from a very personal level, uh, would love you to share some of your personal challenges and maybe one area of personal growth that you would say was a gift uh, from this pandemic. You're on mute. Yeah, yeah. So you said thank you. First, first of all, thank you, Carol. Thank you, Alan, for all you do. Congratulations to all the leaders. We're very honored to be part of this effort for, for something much, much needed. A, a gift from the pandemic. My God, you start with a very difficult question. Uh, number one, in my life, personal and work, they're all one and, and the same. So I don't make any distinctions <laughs> for, for whatever that's worth. The pandemic, I, th I think, uh, in my view, raises the point uh, that uh, people of of means, whatever that means, are basically position, financially, uh, any kind of uh, power, whatever, they have to rise to the occasion. And I think it's uh, even under normal circumstances, I do believe that people with means, whatever the means means, uh, they have to do the best to, to actually share and contribute. And uh, the pandemic, I think, basically highlighted that need highlighted the need for leadership and highlighted the need for people in leading positions to really work double time. Uh, in, in our case, it, it was easy because uh, we are a philanthropic organization, so all we do is we try to help. 
and of course more help is needed under such a, such as a, you know the circumstances of a truly global global pandemic so in a way work wise we had more work to do uh, but we are very lucky to be in a position to help and uh, and uh, you know you can go on and on about what the what the pandemic means uh, for leaders but i think it did expose a lot of issues that we have as a society and what worries me already, I'm 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 a bit hopeful, more hopeful than than most. That I think the the vaccination will work fast, maybe faster than what we all think. And I believe in in two or three months we'll be able to really go back to some kind of basic no, normalcy. What worries me is what happens next. Have we learned anything? And are we doing anything about it? And I do worry about that. I think there's so much pent up demand about. Uh, everybody is going to want to return to, to normal, even though people say it's, it's going to be different. I believe it's going to be almost exactly the same. And the thing is, I think that uh, any kind of leader has to, again, as uh, Mr. Larson said, collaboration. We have to work together and think about the next day and think about what did we learn and what can we do for the next COVID. I hope it's COVID 45 or 50 and not COVID in the 20s. But uh, it's going to come. The next one is going to come. So I already worry about what, what have we learned and what are we doing about it. So I didn't maybe answer your question specifically, but just a few thoughts. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Andreas. Alejandro, do you want to add something about your personal learnings um, during this year of crisis? Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to do that. I, I you know, uh, two things were, uh, I think, my uh, personal, uh, most important personal learnings. Sorry, my, my it's, sorry, my, my two things I think are, are some of my more important personal learnings. In Colombia, there is a, a couple of things happened when the crisis hit. And uh, the first thing is uh, we put our foundation as well to work very quickly to see how we could support the, uh, 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 the country. And what we learned then was, uh, well, we already knew, but what, what we reacted very quickly to was the fact that 40 percent of Colombia or so is, is informal from an economic standpoint. So uh, uh, people were really very much in, in trouble very quickly and we needed to find a way to enhance their food security. So we put our foundation to work in three ways. The first thing was to uh, protect uh, people's food security and the most vulnerable people to make sure they had something to eat. This is a complicated uh, uh, topic in the sense that uh, how long do you do it for and how do you wean people off because they get used to it. And uh, we needed to make sure that uh, once they came out of the foundation, uh, uh, of this crisis, they had other ways of, of, of maintaining their, their ability to, uh, um, uh, to feed themselves. So the other thing the foundation did was uh, focus on uh, uh, medical equipment, uh, not just ventilators, but uh, uh, you know, protective uh, equipment for the uh, health services. And the last thing, which is extremely important, was the um, uh, mental health of people. We set up hotlines and uh, different uh, 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 apps in order to help uh, vulnerable populations with regards to their mental health. And uh, uh, in some cases, uh, also addressing domestic violence, which was on the rise during the pandemic and during the lockdowns. So uh, I, I think one of my most important learning experiences is that uh, uh, the, uh, the importance of people's mental health, even from the beginning, you know, we're starting to see the effects of it after now a, a many months of, of lockdown. But uh, at the very beginning, uh, we saw a, a need there and it's something that we reacted to quickly. I think going forward, we're going to focus much more on mental health issues from our own foundation. Uh, uh, going forward. Um, obviously, we also learned that uh, the most vulnerable people were the most affected by it. Um, besides that, I would say that uh, 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 we, we, I also had a big learning experience uh, from uh, some of the things I do in New York. I, I sit on uh, the Metropolitan Museum's Board of Trustees and on the Executive Committee. I sit on the board of Mount Sinai Hospital. Uh, group, and also I chair Wildlife Conservation Society. Those are three uh, uh, institutions are extremely affected by uh, COVID and will uh, 
continue to be affected by uh, COVID for many years to come. And uh, managing through those crises, WCS runs the Bronx Zoo and uh, the New York Aquarium, as well as the Central Park Zoo, the Prospect Park Zoo, and the Queen Zoo. So all the zoos and aquariums and the aquarium in New York are run by WCS, besides this conservation program, which is uh, international. So uh, uh, something like the Bronx Zoo, where 80% of this attendance is, is during uh, the summer, uh, really created a lot of pressure for this institution and uh, learning to manage through those type of deep pressures has been something that uh, has been, I think, beneficial to to me over the long run. So those are just some examples, uh, but uh, I, um, uh, I think there's a lot of things I've learned over these last nine months and there's still a lot to learn going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, President Daniels, let me come to you. I. I can only imagine um, the, th the things you are having to deal with at the university, balancing multiple priorities and trying to decide what to focus on. Um, how do you manage to d manage the various priorities and keep the team and everybody engaged during this time? So, uh, Carol, thank you for the question, Alan. Thank you for the invitation to participate uh, in this session. and. Uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that um, it's obviously for an institution as large and as complex as Johns Hopkins, we're a university, we have a very significant uh, research operation that uh, spends billions of dollars a year. We're obviously also um, an institution that has a large health system and we're responsible for the care and delivery of health services. Uh, to hundreds of thousands of people. So it is a very complicated place with about 55,000 employees across the various Johns Hopkins institutions. And so, Carol, your question is a great one, is to, you know, how you keep everything moving. On the one hand, obviously, just the sheer scale of the pandemic and the abruptness uh, of, of the pandemic in terms of the way it disrupted our activities, um, you know, poses very significant challenges just in terms of the day-to-day -day operations of the uh, institutions. And so, you know, for an institution that had only closed once before in its 140-year history, and that was in the 1918 influenza pandemic, you know, the idea that you would have to uh, slow down, suspend, um, institutional activity was not anything that we had been uh, we had ever tabletopped in any significant degree uh, at the same time that you have to confront the need to ramp down your research and educational activities and in the case of the educational activities we literally within a week like all of our peer institutions nationally and internationally were forced to move to the zoom platform but at the same time that you're affecting a significant change in educational activity, getting students off campus, getting your faculty equipped for functioning in this new Zoom environment, managing to ramp down your research activity, later on ramping it back up again in a safe way. Um, but while all this is going on, of course, we are the principal site for the delivery of healthcare and in, 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 in the state of Maryland. And so we're managing a very significant increase in the demand for clinical care. And at a time, of course, where we, like so many other institutions, were grappling with all the uncertainties about uh, COVID, uh, the demand for PPE, do we have enough ventilators? How do we keep our uh, frontline healthcare workers safe? So it was complex and very challenging uh, to you know, put it in simple uh, terms. I think the key, quite simply as to how we've got, we, how we have moved through this is one, um, just being incredibly transparent in the decisions we're making. You know, you know, perhaps over communicating at times, but you know, laying out the principles that matter to us, how we've actually been forced to make decisions um, in this environment, how we've dealt with the scientific um, information that we're receiving, how we're thinking about our various responsibilities to key estates, um, and um, and communicating not once, not every so often, but frequently, so people really feel, particularly in this world that we're in, where so much is distributed online, that we still um, we still are a community together, and so all of that is important, and of course, managing through a very difficult and challenging set of operations issues but as um but as i think all of us as leaders know 
you can't lose the opportunity to continue to advance strategic goals of your institution. And even in this time of the pandemic, to try and seize opportunities that open up where you can do things differently and see an opportunity to advance the long-term strategic interest of the institutions you're leading. And we've sought to do all this simultaneously. So it is enormously uh, challenging, um, at times uh, enormously overwhelming, but in a way it's also, it's been a time of um, that is exhilarating and imbued with optimism. Excellent, excellent. Well, Ola, you've had the opportunity to support organizations going through the crisis, but also at a board level. Um, sh share with us some of the challenges that CEOs who are the top of the organization and top teams are going through and how you've been able to support them from a board perspective during this time. Yeah, thank you first for um, all the, the uh, for your questions and also for having me on this uh, panel. Well, uh, as a board member, and I've been a board member for in more than 40 companies uh, during 30 years. And I've seen crisis, you know, both, both in 2000 and we had also Lehman Brothers, and now we have the COVID. And there's something similar in all these, and that is uh, that you have trust and that you also have uh, goals for the, go the same visions and also the strategies how to deal with it. Now with the COVID, uh, it hits us all, you know, worldwide at the same time. So um, what worries us as a board is, uh, of course, our suppliers, our customers and our employees. Uh, how do they cope with just the fact that they might be infected? So that's one practical thing. Now, uh, from a more economical point of view, it's about bankruptcy. And we then see to how can we support each other, how to make uh, suppliers survive, how to make customers not wanting us to be in bankruptcy. Uh, and of course, uh, different companies deals with this in different ways. So um, from my, my perspective and my experience is that we talk a lot about values and leadership, etc. And to me, it's really about the human value interface. And when it's a crisis, and we have a crisis right now, uh, then it's very, very important that the board, together with the executive management, uh, share the values and see to the company's best and not to uh, different shareholders' interests or any other specific interest, um, but the, uh, the society and the company in working in a society. So. Um, I think that uh, it has been and it is really uh, a struggle for many uh, companies right now. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think that we have learned a lot about uh, how to quickly and swiftly solve things. So, for example, just to give you an example, um, you know, we have shut down many, com many of the com companies shut down in February and March. Now <laughs> we're waiting for 40 containers just to be able to handle our components out to our customers. That's one company. While other companies are, are more into struggling by, with finance and doing right emissions, etc. Uh, and of course, um, you want the company to survive. That's, uh, that's for sure. And how to help that. And then you have to be courage. You have to have courage. And you have to be able to listen to the others and also gain some kind of I would say not control, but you have to gain uh, collective control of what's happening and that you share the, the way forward. And if you don't do that, then the company can fail quite very quickly. And that's, uh, that's not a good opportunity. But I, I'm quite optimistic when it comes to the next phase of the COVID. Uh, I think that we learned a lot about how to interact how to trust each, each other, how to trust suppliers, and also how to reach out customers. Excellent. Uh, Andreas, let me come back to you. Um, obviously, this is a time where multiple stakeholders are having to collaborate more than ever. So whether it's philanthropists and private organizations and government, what, what are you seeing in terms of the evolving landscape of multiple players coming together? And how, 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 
how much do you think this will, will be something that's more enduring rather than something we do because we're in a crisis and kind of go back to um, focusing on what we do best or what we did best before the pandemic? I, I hope for the former. I'm afraid of the latter. Uh, we 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 believe a lot in all kinds of collaborations. We believe a lot also in in private public partnerships. We have been saying it for a long time. I think governments on their own cannot do it. Private on its own cannot and actually should not do it either. I think it's a very uh, simple uh, exercise. We have to work together, public and private, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and you have seen that. I mean, in all in, in all the big crises, uh, unless we work together, we are doomed. And the crises are going to get uh, stronger and 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 more difficult to 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 deal with. Whether it's medical, whether it's uh, you know technology and and everything else. So we do have to work together. Do we work together? Not as much as we should. Uh, and yes, we work together only when it gets really. To the last minute, whether it's politics, whether it's uh, egos, whether it's uh, agendas, so a lot more has to be done on it, and that's why again I think all of that should be under the umbrella. Once we get once we get vaccinated, <laughs> we don't have time to rest. I mean, I think we should go to, to the next chapter, which is we get together and we talk about what did we learn. If we don't do it now, where we're still fresh from the whole experience, whether it's fear, whether it's uncertainty, whether it's everything. If we don't do it now, uh, while you know it's still a hot issue, we will go back to what we used to do. And unfortunately, next time we're going to be hit, uh, hit, hit harder. And I'm, a, I'm an optimist, but, but this is the reality. So it's OK to be an optimist, but you have to face re reality. And, and, and again, to do that, you need leadership. And you need leadership uh, in all sectors, whether it's uh, you know politicians, public, private. Philanthropy is only you know the what I call it the smallest third leg. Uh, but in all these sectors, you need you need real leaders who will appreciate the need to work together, and and they need not to just say it, to do it, and also plan for it. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I agree um, totally. <laughs> if I might, mm -hmm. sorry. Absolutely. I think that, uh, I think that it's real about uh, coming together. Uh, and for me, it's uh, politics, it's science, it's business, it's a civil society. And that's what's so wonderful with Telberg. That's there where we can meet and discuss without being, we have different hats on and we can we can interact. And I think this, this could help, you know, bringing building bridges between different interests and I think it's very important that uh, one understand what's what's the interest uh, for for each party we can talk about the common visions etc but if we don't understand the values of the other person or organization or company or party or whatever it is uh, I think that we need to really sit down and discuss discuss and discuss so I agree excellent thank you um, uh, can, I, can I add to... something on that? Yeah, can I just Jump. add something on that? I, I, I agree that collaboration is extremely important and especially public and private collaboration. There's a good example of that in Colombia where uh, Colombia lost its ability to produce vaccines in about 02. It didn't lose it, it gave it up, let's say. But uh, producing vaccines, doing it again and getting uh, 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 back on track to being able to produce vaccines is a very long and difficult road. And uh, what happened at that point in time is that the government got together with uh, a bunch of business leaders and we started to uh, see how we could go about uh, our vaccine strategy. And the Colombian vaccine strategy was very much driven by a public-private partnership. And the importance there is that the private sector in this case can do a lot of things that the government wasn't able to. And for example, uh, we were able to put some capital at risk in order to uh, buy certain vaccines for the country, uh, something that the government wouldn't be able to do because by constitution that would put that would be too risky a proposition for government officials to sign off on. So I, I do think this is an extremely important thing. And and the truth is that this crisis has has broken down all these barriers in and 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 about how we do things and 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 I think we need to take advantage of that in order to uh, uh, to you know rethink about how we do public and private partnerships and move them forward and be more efficient about them going forward. Great. 
you know, um, Carol, do you mind if I jump in on this? You can. Can I also ask something that you can add to to your sure. answer while, while you're answering? Um, I'm, I'm, of course, as you as you explain the work of the university, you work, you obviously operate in a much larger ecosystem, uh, including impact beyond the university and into the community. So as you as you kind of come back, uh, I just wanted to hear some of the things that may have changed in terms of the way that the university has had an impact or collaborated with all the other players in your ecosystem. Thank you. And so, and in fact, your question anticipates where I wanted to uh, pick up because I think that, you know, much of the way in which has been described by uh, my other co-panelists, you know, we very much have seen that there is this opening for collaboration and a sense of comedy um, across institutions of uh, public, private, intermediate institutions that wasn't there before. And that's encouraging and exciting. So, you know, things like even the responsibilities that uh, we have taken on in Baltimore uh, to ensure the delivery of food to neighborhoods that we know many people at, with job losses and so forth, or during the you know the most intense stages of uh, the lockdown, they weren't able to access food. That we we basically participated with church groups, with with other organizations, and were able to mount the delivery of over two uh, two million uh, meals to uh, to our community. That was a really exciting opportunity. Other things that we've done, even you know, something quite unprecedented, was to work with the city, with the state, and with uh, with insurers and with other healthcare systems within the region to get a rational uh, way of treating, managing, assessing people um, who were either exposed to or actually have been infected with COVID. We don't usually do that. And again, that creates a sense of possibility. So I want to, I, on one level, I want to be optimistic and sort of heed, you know, the spirit of what my other co-panelists have said. But on the other hand, um, I think it's really important not to lose sight of, you know, at least on a national basis in this country, look at how incredibly divided we are. You know, look at the limits of of science, you know, that this sense that we had a clear set of grounded, rigorous public health injunctions about the importance of social distancing, of masking. And, you know, this was evidence-based. Um, it was you know, verified by lots of different experts. We would have thought that the that under the threat of this truly uh, devastating pandemic, we would have come together, embraced that, and acted as one nation. And we haven't. And so, you know, I think in some sense, this really also underscores the importance of taking a look at some of the core structural issues that we have to confront as a society. Andreas uh, and Alan will both know uh, well of the work that really um, has come from Andreas's leadership around SNF Agora at Hopkins. But, you know, this is really in some sense uh, doubled and redoubled our commitment to really trying to understand why is it even in the face of something that was so overwhelming, so universal, so shattering, we couldn't really uh, get this together and have one voice, one approach with a strong sense of uh, our common uh, purpose in humanity. So, I, you know, I, I, I think that's a more sobering, uh, uh, but I think realistic uh, component of where we are today. Okay. We only have a couple more minutes, but I was wondering if a couple of you could share um, one of the hallmarks of, of a great leader is to reflect on, you know, what's happened over this time. Uh, knowing what you know now, um, is there anything you could have done differently? Or what, what is something you would have done differently? I can start. Uh, I think that uh, it's about having a conversation ongoing all the time about what's the priorities. Uh, and if you have that, then it's much easier. I can see that on different kind of uh, different kind of uh, companies. I mean, those who have this, this ongoing discussions, they are more healthier, if I may say so, than the others. So you have Excellent. to be prepared. Thank you, Ula. I, I would say, uh, I would, sorry, Dan, go, sorry, no, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Andres. I'll follow. No, I would just say what I tell my kids every night when they go to bed, just make sure you do the best you can, give it all you have. And I think whether it's a crisis or no crisis, I think that's something that's that may be missing from, from our society. But I think everybody in his or, or her position, just give it all you have and, and work together because uh, the problems that we are facing, 
uh, globally are much bigger than any of us. Excellent. Thank you. I think on my end, I would say if I had, you know, if I had the benefit of hindsight to do it all over again, um, I think we would have done, I would have done a better job on bracing the community for just the duration of this. I think that as we started off, we, we thought this was going to be relatively contained, that we would get our arms wrapped around it uh, quickly, that we were accommodating a, you know, a brief, you know, uh, if, if, you know, not weeks, a few months disruption. I don't think we had any sense of the long march that we've been involved in. And I think in some ways, um, I, knowing that we, we would have done better in, in just psychologically preparing people for what we are still deeply embroiled in. Thank you. Um, I, from my standpoint, I think I, I agree that, uh, you know, in, in places like Colombia, we always have to be prepared for a crisis, but we're, we're never right, quite prepared for a crisis of this magnitude. And I think uh, I agree with what's been said that being able to be prepared for something of this magnitude is a very different story. And I, looking back, I think we will rethink how we are prepared for crises and, and change that. The other thing I would say is, is engagement with our employees. Uh, we've always focused on engagement with our clients, customers, and to a certain degree, our employees. But I would say that that engagement would be uh, much more focused on their personal wellness uh, than it has been in the past. And I think that's something that's very important. Fabulous. Well, um, hope you all join me in thanking our esteemed panelists. That was a really rich conversation. Thanks for sharing your perspectives and adding to this great conversation on leadership. Thank so you, context, context is everything. So to widen the aperture on this conversation, uh, we've uh, asked two wonderful performers, uh, Gisela Avan and John C.B. Okumu, uh, to read a series of pieces for us. So over to you, Gisela and John. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham city jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day. And I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century BC left their villages and carried their thus saith the Lord 
far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. And just as the apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. Dear friends, on the 9th of October 2012, the Taliban shot me on the left side of my forehead. They shot my friends too. They thought that the bullets would silence us, but they failed. And then out of that silence came thousands of voices. The terrorists thought that they would change our aims and stop our ambition. But nothing in my life changed except this. Weakness, fear, and homelessness died. Strength, power, and courage was born. I am the same Malala. My ambitions are the same. My hopes are the same. My dreams are the same. Dear sisters and brothers, I am not against anyone. Neither am I here to speak in terms of personal revenge against the Taliban or any other terrorist group. I am here to speak up for the right of the education for every child. I want education for the sons and the daughters of all the extremists, especially the Taliban. I do not even hate the Talib who shot me. Even if there is a gun in my hand and he stands in front of me, I would not shoot him. This is the compassion that I've learned from Muhammad, the prophet of mercy, Jesus Christ and the Lord Buddha. This is the legacy of change that I've inherited from Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela and Muhammad Ali Jinnah. This is the philosophy of nonviolence that I have learned from Gandhiji, Bacha Khan, and Mother Teresa. And this is the forgiveness that I have learned from my mother and father. This is what my soul is telling me. Be peaceful and love everyone. Dear sisters and brothers, we realize the importance of light when we see darkness. We realize the importance of our voice when we are silenced. Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity 
and of the equal and Ill inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind. And the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief and freedom from fear and want has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of the common people. Whereas it is essential, if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. Whereas it is essential to promote the development of friendly relations between nations. Whereas the peoples of the United Nations have in the Charter reaffirmed their faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and in the equal rights of men and women, and have determined to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. Whereas member states have pledged themselves to achieve in cooperation with the United Nations, the promotion of universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Whereas a common understanding of these rights and freedoms is of the greatest importance for the full realization of this pledge. Now, therefore, the General Assembly proclaims this universal declaration of human rights as a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations to the end that every individual and every organ of society keeping this declaration constantly in mind shall strive by teaching and education to promote respect for these rights and freedoms and by progressive measures, national and international, to secure their universal and effective recognition and observance, both amongst the peoples of member states themselves and among the peoples of territories under their jurisdiction. Thank you, Gazala. Thank you, John. Context does always matter, as Carol said. We've now come to the end of our live stream session of this program. I want to thank all of you from literally around the world who've been with us for the last couple hours. Urge you to come back tomorrow, same time, same station. Uh, those of you who are with us as we go forward, uh, don't do anything. We're about to uh, share with you a little bit of our Telberg DNA. Uh, in the form, again, of something we love dearly, Telberg Fiddlers.